Lieber Herr Rettig, uh, dear friends, it's for me as a non-native German speaker always difficult not to speak German when I have to speak here in Frankfurt, but I understand the official language uh, is uh, English. As always, Mr. Rattig has been extremely polite and flattering uh, in presenting me, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, this uh, event uh, with the European School has something to do with my speech today, and that is the independence of central banks. And uh, when it comes to the financing of schools, that is a government task. And if the ECB has to finance what a government, either federal or local level or regional level, ought to do, that is called monetary financing. So I said there is no difference between attempts to make the central bank finance government tasks between the southern part of Europe and the northern part of Europe. And why is monetary financing anathema to us? Because of independence. And today, again, I will speak of an area where my main concern is the independence of central banks. And for me, it is not only the Bundesbank which is independent, but it is also, if you will allow me, the ECB and all the other national central banks which ought to be independent. And um, here it is more an issue between independence as to monetary policy, and to supervision. And I have in the past uh, very often made the distinction that the independence of the ECB is not an institutional independence, but a functional independence, meaning that monetary policy is independent. But when it comes to supervision, there is a higher amount of accountability because there is still, at the end, at this stage at least, as we have not yet completed the banking union, there is still a issue of taxpayers' money being involved. During the 2008 financial crisis, counterparty risks became, to say the least, infamous. Obviously, every finance textbook deals with the risk that when you enter into a financial contract, the other party may not fulfill their part of the agreement and may even default on their obligation. But the failure of Lehman Brothers, also here in Germany, and the large loss suffered by AIG in the over-the-counter derivatives market revealed by then that there were counterparty risks throughout the entire financial system. This was due to the domino effect of counterparty defaults in leveraged products. As a response, G20 leaders agreed at the 2009 summit in Pittsburgh to move all standardized derivatives contracts to clearing through central counterparty CCPs, address the weaknesses exposed during the crisis, by insulating counterparties from each other's default risks. These CCPs specialized in managing counterparty credit risk, and by doing so, they reduce the risk of default spreading across the whole financial system. But CCPs can only make uh, the system safer if they are safe themselves. In the European Union, they are subject to a comprehensive regulatory framework, the European Market Infrastructure Regulation, so-called EMIR regulation, ensures that they hold robust resources to deal with the financial distress. And it introduces a cooperative approach to CCP supervision, involving all relevant supervisors but not only supervisors, also central banks in so-called colleges to ensure that the CCPs are properly overseen across member states. The global regulatory push towards central clearing has contributed to making CCPs extremely important parts of the global financial system. And in 2009, 
for example, just 40% of all interest rate derivative contracts were cleared through CCPs. By 2017, this figure had increased to 83%. The rising importance of CCPs means that their supervisory framework also needs to be reformed. Most clearing is now done across border and it is strongly concentrated in a limited number of European Union CCPs which have become systemically important for the whole European Union. Two of these CCPs are located in the United Kingdom. Currently, they clear around 95% of euro-denominated interest rate derivatives and around 30% of euro-denominated repos. Thus, a significant disturbance involving a major UK CCP could affect financial stability, as well as market functioning across the EU. On top of this, most of the liquidity provided by central banks tends, obviously, to be channeled through the repo market. The United Kingdom's withdrawal from the EU means a supervisory framework for non-EU countries must be adapted. EU authorities must continue to be able to not only closely monitor UK CCPs, but also to ensure that they comply with European Union regulation. So precautions have to be taken to ensure that CCPs do not become the weak point for monetary policy, and the currencies that are issued by central banks inside the European Union, beyond the euro. CCPs can pose significant risks to the smooth operation of payment systems and also to monetary policy transmission in times of market stress. And let me just give you some examples to this effect. Market volatility or failures in CCP's risk management may affect liquidity within the financial system and the liquidity of CCP users who are typically monetary policy counterparties and also key participants in the payment systems. In extreme situations, liquidity shortfalls could foster contagion and lead to CCP's and banks becoming distressed. This could mean the ECB needs to provide, or would need at that time, to provide liquidity to systemic CCPs or to their members to ensure that payment systems continue to function smoothly and also that monetary policy can be transmitted effectively. Why would it be the ECB rather than the national central banks? Uh, because of the sheer size and volumes that uh, today are flowing through these uh, systemic CCPs. It is clear that in such cases, liability and control need to be well aligned. And I think this is a sentence that I have heard many times here in Germany. Liability and control need to be well aligned. And I fully agree. The ECB must be able not only to monitor, but also to control the risks that are posed by CCPs. CCPs are also directly relevant for payment systems, which is also one of the tasks of the central bank. But we assume that the payment is part of the monetary policy cluster. So we do oversight of financial market infrastructure, not as the supervisor does it, in order to make sure that the regulations are respected, but in order to make sure that the monetary policy is functioning perfectly. Cleared markets represent a significant share of financial markets as a whole, meaning that CCPs are settling large payment volumes, and in order to ensure that payment systems continue 
to function smoothly. The ECB must ensure that CCPs have appropriate arrangements in place for liquidity management as well as for settlement in euro. Moreover, in the past, CCPs have increased margins and collateral haircuts beyond the levels that would have been required by pure prudential standards or their own risk models. And I remember during the crisis, must have been 2011 or 12, when um, the CCPs increased the margin calls uh, on uh, Spanish collateral, and uh, this was highly pro-cyclical and not justified by their own risk models. But doing so, they might therefore cause liquidity strains and also increase volatility in bond prices, which in turn affects the transmission of monetary policy. To be clear, CCPs should of course make sure they remain perfectly resilient to liquidity risks, but they should do so in a predictable manner and also based on sound risk models that should not undercut monetary policy decisions. These challenges were widely recognized when in June of last year the European Commission proposed amending the EMIR framework for the supervision and regulation of CCPs. The Commission acknowledges not only the role to be played by the supervisor, but also the essential role played by the central bank of issue in monitoring and addressing risk posed by CCPs to their currency, and has proposed an enhanced and binding role for central bank of issues under the new EMIR framework. This would mean that central banks would become non-voting members because we act as monetary policy and we cannot vote on any other body which is uh, uh, subject to another objective than our single objective of price stability. So we be would become non-voting members of the European Securities and Markets Authority structure within this authority, within ESMA, that would be responsible for CCPs. ESMA aims to improve the functioning of financial markets in Europe by strengthening investor protection and also strengthening cooperation among the national competent authorities. But the enhanced role of central banks would tend to avoid harmful mismatches between the prudential decisions on the one hand and monetary policy decisions on the other hand. And it would grant central banks a flexible and effective role in determining the conditions under which CCPs that are located in one EU member state are allowed to provide services throughout the European Union. And it also would determine the conditions under which we would recognize out, uh, CCPs that are located outside the European Union. The ECB early on welcomed the proposal to strengthen the role of CBIs. It would reinforce a coordinated supervision while reflecting at the same time the responsibilities of the ECB as central bank of issue within the supervisory framework. However, although EU legislators can incorporate a role for CBIs into the processes for supervising CCPs, the regulation cannot go so far as to confer on the ECB the sort of binding instruments this enhanced role would require. And we thought we had this power. We had the conferral of these powers already at least uh, until 2015 when the UK challenged us in the lower court in Luxembourg uh, on this matter. 
And in 2015, the General Court held that the ECB does have competence to regulate on payment systems and on clearing systems, but they said you have no power to regulate on clearing security systems. And that includes the CCPs. The court, moreover, stated that the ECB would need to request an amendment to our statutes, namely Article 22 of the statutes of the ESCB and the ECB, which already right now enables us, as I said, uh, to regulate payments and clearing system. The ECB's governing council, therefore, swiftly and unanimously adopted a recommendation to amend this Article 22 to extend it to cover explicitly derivatives and to give legal effect to what the Commission was going to propose to us under the new EMIR regulation and to give us the flexibility and autonomy to act outside EMIR for regulatory purposes where clearing would pose a severe threat to the stability of our currency of the Union, which for Euro area member states is the Euro. Let me briefly explain the procedure for amending the statute of the ECB. Because again, for reasons of independence, it was made in the Maastricht Treaty very difficult to change the statutes because it would go to constitutional majority requiring changes in every member state. The statute is found in the protocol of the EU treaty. Such protocols form an integral, in, integral part of the treaties and this means that in principle the statute can only be changed as a part of a revision of the treaties. However, there are some provisions of the statutes, like this Article 22, which can be amended by means of a simplified amendment procedure where the ECB can recommend a change, which we did unanimously. The Commission can give its opinion, and they say, they gave it opinion, they said, we agree that you change it, but we would like that you are subject to secondary legislation, which we consider as something that is constitutionally very difficult to submit through secondary legislation, primary constitutional law. Finally, the Council and the European Parliament will adopt a decision to amend the statute by simple majority. We are still in the midst of discussion uh, of uh, this change to our statutes. And given that the simplified amendment procedure is in itself an exception. We have to be very careful what we change in Article 22 and how we are going about to change it. And any change must comply with the other provisions, of course, and also with the principles of the treaties, which by themselves enjoy a higher political and constitutional rank. For example, a change in Article 22 must respect the principle of central bank independence. And it cannot put now in the treaty that monetary policy is subject to supervision. And it must also respect the exclusive competence of the ECB to conduct monetary policy. And it cannot invite a third authority to give instructions how to deal with monetary policy. And as I said, Article 22 is in the chapter four of our statutes, which determines the monetary policy functions and tools and instruments. So it is clearly within monetary policy that we have to act. But what does that mean for the substance of Article 22? The statutes grant the ECB flexibility and autonomy over the instruments that is available to it to conduct monetary policy. The treaty had 
provided various instruments, including the possibility, for example, to conduct open market and credit operations, and also to make regulations to ensure efficient and sound payment and clearing systems. We used what was in the treaty during exceptional circumstances to launch exceptional measures, which are now slowly coming to the beginning of their end. This means that the ECB can react effectively also to unforeseen circumstances. For example, the ECB was able to take the unconventional monetary policy measures it saw fit to address unprecedented economic developments during the last crisis and thus also to achieve its primary objective of maintaining price stability in the euro area. And price stability is not a definition which is only with an upper limit, it is also price stability an obligation to avoid deflation which can be as bad as inflation. This flexibility and autonomy is a clear expression of the principle of central bank independence and of the euro system's exclusive competence to define and also to implement monetary policy. This simplified amendment procedure does, of course, not give us a carte blanche to rewrite the treaties and the principles that underpin the ECB and the euro system. Rather, it only allows us to make small targeted adjustments to our monetary policy toolkit, and since we have forced all the transactions in derivatives onto CCBs, this is only to follow the regulatory developments and continue to make monetary policy effective. That is the only purpose why we want to change this Article 22. Article 22 should not be changed to contain an inflexible an exhaustive list of measures than the ECB can take. This would be a limitation of monetary policy and it would constrain monetary policy. The ECB needs broad discretion to take the necessary measures and address risks to monetary policy and the smooth operation of payment systems. Extreme market events are impossible to predict and central banks have a unique expertise and also competence to assess and to address the risks they pose to monetary policy. And second, as I have already said, Article 22 cannot now be transformed in order to subordinate ECB measures to the level of secondary union law for example, by requiring them to be consistent with secondary legislation that is adopted by the Council or Parliament, or the Council and Parliament could, through this subordination, influence monetary policy. This would create a hierarchy of internal market legislation over monetary policy measures, and this legally cannot happen. We cannot open a Pandora's box and end up in a situation where monetary policy is no longer shielded against policy influence, political influence. Moreover, any such subordination would imply that the objective of the internal market at the EU level is superior to the objective of economic and monetary union in the euro area. This cannot be the case. Both EMU and internal market are equal and complementary objectives of the monetary union. And this has even been decided upon by the European Court of Justice in the famous uh, Pringle case. They said, and I quote now, that each institution of the union is to act within the limits of the powers conferred on it by the treaties and in conformity with the procedures, conditions and objectives set out in them. 
end of quote. Does this mean that we have limitless power? By no means. We have a limitation. If we extend our competence through Article 22, it cannot confer a general regulatory competence on the ECB. It can only adjust the ECB's monetary policy toolkit by clarifying that the competence that we have already for clearing and payment systems also covers derivatives, since the legislator has forced derivatives onto the CCPs. The treaty drafters made the ECB's objectives and tasks very clear. As the European Court of Justice again said, the measure that falls under responsibility of the ECB when it is intended to pursue an objective such as the consistency of monetary policy or the proper transmission of monetary policy. This is the only reason why we can act. This objective in turn contributes to the primary monetary policy objective of maintaining price stability. The reason why monetary policy needs to cover CCP's liquidity is that derivatives clearing has become a cornerstone of the financial system. And I very much hope that uh, our endeavors are well recognized in all the capitals that are up to now still negotiating the final text of the EMEA regulation and which will also have uh, to uh, discuss our Article 22. Because we must not forget that ECB measures must comply with the principle of proportionality. There cannot be mission creep by the central bank. Because any ECB actions in the field of clearing will have to be appropriate for attaining monetary policy objectives. And it cannot go beyond what is necessary to achieve those objectives. It goes without saying that the ECB will not be acting in a legal vacuum in considering the proportionality of its actions it will have to take into account, obviously, existing secondary law, and we have to justify also our measures when we take them with our objective of monetary policy. Anyway, the Court of Justice will be the ultimate arbiter to determine whether the ECB is respecting the principle of proportionality. So let me conclude. It has become evident that disturbances affecting CCPs can have an impact on monetary policy, on payment systems, on the transmission of monetary policy, and ultimately on price stability. The Commission's proposal to amend the EMEA framework is a step in the right direction as it reflects the responsibilities of the ECB as a central bank of issue inside the supervisory framework. However, we also need to adjust the ECB's monetary policy toolkit to ensure that it can fulfill its role. We cannot get always new tasks by secondary law. We can only get new tasks if the treaty is allowing to give us new tasks. So even if a legislator would like to bestow more extended tasks um, to the central bank, we would say no, unless there is a change in the treaty. And this is why we also have to change Article 22, the statute, if we want to exercise the competencies that the Commission wants to bestow on us through secondary legislation. Any change of Article 22 must, however, preserve the ECB's flexibility and autonomy in order to preserve its independence. And if some countries want now to have an extensive amount of constraint and limitations on how we exercise our monetary policy powers, this would be an attack on the independence of the central bank. And I hope this is well understood even in the largest country of Europe. 
ultimately amending both EMIR and Article 22, will establish a comprehensive legal framework to address the risks CCPs pose to the Union, both its financial markets and its currency. It will ensure that the EU legislators, supervisors and central bank, each one acting in their respective role that has been attributed to them in the treaties, they can adopt a wide range of measures which will all be needed to safeguard financial stability. Let's make sure we don't waste this opportunity. Thanks for your attention. Mr. Mesh, thank you very much for, uh, I think we all understood it's like treading a fine line when it comes to the independence of the ECB, at the same time the increased risk that what we might face when Brexit comes and uh, majority of the clearing will take place somewhere else in the third country. Uh, let us be perhaps a bit uh, plain. I would like to ask you what you think what will happen to Euro clearing. Do you think it will move to Europe? Will, do you think we'll find a solution that it can stay in the UK? What's your opinion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> market, de market developments follow their own logic. But what is needed is to have clear regulation and a clear regulatory framework. And that is what we are working on now, to have a clear regulatory framework so that markets can see what can be done uh, according to where they are located. And how are we supervised uh, and how are we influencing uh, third countries, um, I would say, fate and well-being uh, while uh, not being supervised by those uh, authorities. I think that is understood that cannot be. So we have a mandate to safeguard the integrity of our currency and of our EMU, and we will do everything in order to implement it. But how markets will translate that into behavior, that is uh, a matter for uh, market participants, the efficiency of the services that are being offered, the price of the services that are being offered, and uh, I fully agree with some people that if we have excessive fragmentation, this will increase the price. So we are not for excessive fragmentation. We are not for necessary a forced relocation, but we are very determined to enforce the integrity and the well-functioning of the European infrastructure in order to support our currency. Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, unfortunately, we have to end that now. And um, because of our time constraint of uh, the lunch break, which is, uh, I think, in almost 30 minutes. So we would um, thank you again, Mr. Okay. Mersch, and uh, thanks a lot for your insight.